Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Countdown to Scream 2022. You know us now. I'm Perry, and this is Joel, and we love Scream. What's up, Joel? How you doing? I am good. I'm I'm excited to talk about uh, Scream 2022 again, making predictions, putting our wants and desires out into the world, and hoping that uh, the cinematic gods hear them and grant them. Yeah. All right. I, I like looking at this episode that way. I want to put it out into the world and like <laughs> manifest some of these things. So that yeah, let's ignore the fact that it's already been written and produced, right? But that's fine. We can yeah, still yeah. manifest. We can still, we can still change the game here. <laughs> so I think so. I think that's so. the plan for this episode is we are going to give you a list, specifically 10 items that we want to see in Scream 2022. And then we're also going to name a couple things we'd rather not see. But we're going to focus mm -hmm. on, on the positive, the things that we really want to see happen in this movie. Do you want me to take it first, or do you want to start with one of yours? You know, I think I might go in, um, because go I, I had another rewatch of Scream 4 the other day, uh, just feeling it, you know. Um, people know that Scream 4 is my least favorite of the movies, but I, I found new angles to appreciate in it, and of course just reconfirmed my love of Kirby. Uh, the character played by Hayden Panettiere. So if I'm going to put one on the board as my first pick for what I want in Scream 2022, aka Scream 5, aka Scream, uh, it is Kirby uh, and Hayden Panettiere, that character, to return to this universe. And it's possible, right? Because unlike many, like, this person is dead and their guts are hanging out of their uh, abdomen uh, and there's no questioning or the eye shot where you know that's a dead eye, uh, Kirby didn't get that. She was just kind of like stab uh, uh, and sort of left it up in the air. She could have done a Dewey, you know, the how Dewey always rolls out at the end and sort of like, uh, yeah. so it's a possibility. I, I would believe that. And I wouldn't mind seeing that happen. We'll get to this later in the show, but I've seen a lot of theories about so-and-so isn't really dead. And I don't like those, but I like no, that. No, we don't like those at all. I, re I really because like the Kirby idea. It's possible. And I think the thing about Kirby is I was watching that movie and I think in Scream 4, one of the issues I have with it is that so, up, like Scream 3 in a way, it's so overpopulated with new characters and old characters and trying to get the balance. And a lot of those new characters don't get a chance to shine and the writing doesn't really serve them. But Hayden Panettiere just comes in and like makes a lot out of out of very little. And I think it's really impressive. And so I want that energy. She's she's high energy. I want her back. I feel like I don't want to take away from, from the writing, but a lot of the success of Kirby comes through Hayden Panettiere's screen presence. Like she definitely brings yes. that character to life in a very <clears throat> specific way that I think is what caught on for so many people, us included. 100%, I'm sure. Uh, I think this is possibly the character that most people do want to see come back that could possibly come back from a logical uh, narrative point of view. Um, so I don't think I'm alone in this one. Team Kirby, bring her back. Uh, kill her off in the opening scene. I don't care. I just want her there. Yes, please. I'm with you on that. All right. So my first one here, it's, it's kind of a throwaway, but I'm so scarred by what the <laughs> Scream TV series did that I oh. have to say this. I have to just put it out into the world, as we said before. And it's that I absolutely need the traditional ghost face mask in this movie. I mean, that's right, that's yeah. just it. The Scream TV series, it did grow on me eventually, but I will never forget when the first look at that show or the first look at the mask, maybe it was, was here it is, and it's something different. It's something mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I understand that when you continue a series, you need to change things up and show new things in order to justify the continuation. You can't just repeat stuff over and over, but... The ghost face mask, I was watching Jason X the other night because that's what one does on Friday the 13th. And it's like, we've seen the evolution of, of Jason's mask. And we've seen the evolution of some other uh, iconic horror slasher masks, but- Michael gets sort of the rougher color. treatment occasionally. Yeah, it, It's like little touches that are different. That was like, where did this come from? And I, it really I know, I know. rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah, that, that, that series, which I think the first season is actually particularly quite underrated in some ways, yes. uh, but that, that mask does throw you off from the get and it's like, mm, no. And also I think, uh, I, I honestly, I don't want glow in the dark masks. I don't want a red mask. I don't want 
don't don't as what does Sydney say? Don't with the original, and I feel like that's what yeah. they need to uh, they need to focus on with this with this mask shenanigans. Keep it keep it simple. Keep it, keep it tight. Yes, um, I definitely agree with you on that. All right, what is your second one? My second one is kind of I don't know if it's throwaway, but I think if you consider Scream three and four, it's important to reiterate and again put out into the world. I want actual scares and memorable kills. Like I feel as though I'm all about the comedy. Bring it. That's fun. That's fine. That defines the series. But you also want those moments where you feel genuine terror for these characters and you're feeling genuinely in peril beyond, oh, that's clever. So I think that sort of was a little bit lacking in the last two films. Um, you know, I think Scream 3, with the exception of one sequence on the set with Sydney and Scream 4, with the exception of a few little highlights, doesn't get genuinely terrifying. And I don't think the kills are particularly memorable in the same way that you can say, oh, Cece in Scream 2, or obviously Casey in Scream, uh, and then, uh, you know, or Garage Door. And I always go back to, and I reference this interview all the time because you're such a talented interviewer, Perry, but your interview with the filmmakers from this film on set where they were talking about, you know, how do you make a memorable kill? And it's about that one key element that becomes almost like the quote motif. So mm -hmm. it's the it's the garage door or it's, <clears throat> you know, I don't know, uh, strung up on a tree or whatever it is, or it's bread slicer uh, as we think about Fear Street. And I want some of that. I want really thoughtful, scary, memorable death sequences because I'm kind of crazy like that, I guess. <laughs> I would like that too. I haven't told you this yet, but do you know that I just recently changed my rankings? It feels important to bring up because of how much we're talking about Scream 4 right now. Did you put it in number two? Have you so, have you elevated it? I've rewatched all four of them more times than I can count, but it was mm. a different experience going to the new Bev and sitting through all four of them one after the other. You had and the enviable have, experience of that marathon. I have now changed my ranking of two and three, uh, two and four. So I think wow. I'm now number, like Scream 1 is my favorite. Then I have Scream 4. Then I have Scream 2. Then I have Scream 3. And also that experience just like reaffirmed the fact that I adore them all. But I, yes. felt, I felt like I needed to point that out. Because I also, I think that Scream 3 and Scream 4 in particular have more well-defined kills than they usually get credit for. It's like the one that used to feel lackluster to me was the Olivia kill, but I just, like, I grow to love that one more and more. And that's one that gets far scarier every time I watch it because it is, it is like so dark, vicious, and just sinister. Yeah, I agree with that. I, as I said, I rewatched it just a couple of nights ago. I didn't have the experience of the new Beverly because, you know, I'm on the other coast and would not kill people for tickets, um, as other people seem to have done. Uh, but I agree with you on the Olivia kill. I have always been a bit iffy on that one. I felt it, and I still feel it's a bit rushed um, in terms of execution, but it's nasty and it's vicious and it's so gory. Mm -hmm. And then just like the putting her outside the window and being like displaying it. It's just, that is next level, but I still want better. <laughs> all right, all right, I hear you. I mean, I, I'm very much behind this as well. I've been thinking about it even beyond the Scream franchise, even beyond the horror genre. I just love any form of set piece that is so well defined. It doesn't have to be a specific thing, like let's say garage door, but like a, like a, like, a level of definition that you can always recall the sequence in a flash, something that makes it super memorable and makes it stand out from all of the other set pieces that are likely in whatever movie you're watching. Yeah, I love it. And I will say one film I'll give some credit for that recently is Halloween uh, 2018. I felt that um, mm -hmm. in some ways, you know, obviously that film is a kind of tale of three films in sense. It's like the weird podcast thing, the middle where he just goes on his little rampage and then there's like the brilliant ending. But in that middle section, um, which I like probably less and less the more I see, to be honest, uh, but the sequence with um, the kid and the sensor light and the, yes. uh, the fence, I'm like, that is such a classic, smartly done, uh, inventive use of the everyday to create a memorable kill. And I can go sensor light or fence and I know exactly mm -hmm. what that is. And it's payoff because it ends so brilliantly with that gore shot. Uh, I, I really appreciate that sequence every time, more and more every time I see the film. That actor is also in Fear Street. Um, he is, yes. 
just to explain a little bit about why I emphasize not just horror or not just scream with that comment, because I, I guess I can talk about this now, because when this goes up, the embargo will be up. I recently saw The Protégé with Maggie Q, and there are so many epic action fight sequences in that, but I can recall every single one because they are so well executed and constructed. And it's like not yeah. just the visuals, it's what each fight sequence means for her character that also contributes to the definition of those moments. So that's just an example of another genre that I think uses this quality very, very well. Now your your second uh, <laughs> wish list item for Scream 2022. Yes, please. It is embracing new technology and also how we use social media today. And, you know, that that seems inevitable. They kind of have to do that. I mean, with the first film, they basically made that a requirement with how these kills happen and also the meta nature of, of the movie and, and all of that. But I think the more specific one to see about this is I'm really, and I know this sounds like almost, almost an impossible thing to do, but I really want to see them embrace new technology and social media use in a way that speaks to how we use it today, but is also done in a manner that doesn't make it feel dated tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen so many movies out there that, you know, I don't know, have like text message bubbles or something popping up on screen. And even though I can't really put a finger on why, there, there's something about the way that those things have been incorporated in many recent movies that feels like, like tomorrow, that's not going to feel right anymore. And I feel like the, the screen movies have done that in a really solid way. I know that I don't use a landline or anything anymore, but there, <laughs> there is a timeless quality, I think, about all four films, even though they embrace current technology. So I just hope that this new screen movie can accomplish the same thing. 100%. I think it's going to be really exciting to see because you can see it getting quite silly now because I think one of the other things about rewatching Scream 4, and I'm not quite with you on Scream 4, but I appreciate it so oh, much yeah. more, but the opening sequence, the Stab 7 opening, no, uh, Stab 6 opening sequence, uh, where they're Facebook stalker killer, I was expecting the next time I watched that to feel, you know, that feel more hokey or less or just dated, and it didn't. It felt like this could almost, so this is, yeah, I experienced this. I know people who experience this kind of thing. It didn't feel out of touch. The use of smartphones in that movie mm -hmm. felt right. Um, I think the one that wavers a little bit is Scream 3, because I'm just not into like the voter, vocoder sort of like voice changing technology kind of was silly, or the fax machine. I, th I thought um, you were gonna bring up the, the fax, fax machine. machine. <laughs> people also, still that, use fax machines. Have you seen Ted Lasso? That is true. I think that movie got gas wrong, though. So I feel like I have to go to the very basics uh, of technology on that level. We're talking industrial revolution stuff. But um, yeah, I think I'm really excited. But it could, you know, I think I've said to you, I don't want to see Ghostface TikToking. Um, I don't want so because it can't, there's so many options now, right? And they're the way that kids interact. And we've seen the cast of this movie, they look, you know, we're looking at high school age, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know, is this gonna be Snap, TikTok, WhatsApp? Uh, and how does that become threatening? Uh, and do we lose phone calls? Because I do feel so much of what's great about these films is the vocal and is the is the phone call. It's. A, I mean, it's a good question. I feel like they could manage to make this work without using social media because I'm a big TikTok fan and, you know, I'm kind of hoping that one's around to stay. But there's mm. always, you know, that thought in the back of my mind is like, is this going to be the next Vine where it's hot right now and then it disappears in a flash? I, I don't really think that's going to happen, but... I want them to steer clear of apps that that could possibly happen with because that would right. be a death sentence in terms of what we're talking about right now. I feel like there's definitely going to be a live Twitch death. I just I feel like we can't like we can't not have thing. Well, they, yeah, like they, a Twitch they fully situation. justified that too with what they bring up in Scream 4. They need to take that to the right, next yes. level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which kind of brings me to my next one, which is, you know, smart use of technology. I want to see smart insights and commentary on today's horror. Yes. And I do feel to an extent that was kind of a part of four um, and three, but in four, it wasn't integrated so much 
into the plot itself, at least commentary on what horror was happening at the time. Uh, there was a lot of talk about torture porn. There was talk about Shaun of the Dead and that kind of thing. But in terms of the actual kills, beyond the sort of recognition of um, found footage, I guess you could say in the live streams, there wasn't really incorporated into the the actual plot and machinations of things. It was still very traditional slasher. And so of course they're gonna stay in that vein because that's the film. Um, but I'm very curious to see A, how they commentate on and B, how they incorporate horror trends of today, which I think are actually harder because it's not as simple as saying today's trend is torture porn or today's trend is um, uh, found footage because it kind of is everything, but there is this mm -hmm. also like elevated horror. And how do you take, how do you comment on A24 style elevated horror in a screen movie, despite the fact that A24 is making a slasher itself? Uh, but then also, do they, you know, which way do they take it? Do they go there? Do they go conjuring James one Blumhouse averse kind of thing? Where are they going to aim their arrows? Is it going to be a melting pot? And how smartly and incisively do they do that? Or do they choose not to get overly caught up in it? I think that's really interesting. If and then, of course, there's also that, the meta thing about being a reboot of a reboot yeah, again well, kind of thing. That's that's where I think they're going. If if uh, <clears throat> I have any hopes for this specific idea, it it would be that, you know, I, I want them to narrow it down to the, the slasher subgenre of horror. Because I think if this movie had a, you know, like a conjuring feel to it, it just... I, I don't really see those pairing well at all, but it's like, you know, we've got, we've got the first scream, which is basically, you know, something that comments on the slasher genre in general. The, the second one leans heavily into what it means to be a sequel. The third one really leans into the idea of what it means to, to, to make a movie in this industry. Mm. And then, you know, four does the, you know, we're a, we're a different generation and here's how you have to, up your game kind of thing. So like, what is the next thing here? And it just feels like the inevitable is going to be, and I don't really know how to put this, but the retcon of it all, the mm. idea of erasing things that happened. And I don't necessarily mean that Scream, and I've seen theories about this out there where some are some are uh, guessing that actually, like almost like they're pulling a, a Final Destination 5. Actually, this film takes place before the events of Scream, of the original Scream. Oh, wow. And it paves the way to that. I don't I don't really see how that's I, I, I don't, um... it's, an <laughs> it's an interesting idea, but I don't think that's that's going to happen. And, you know, the idea that, oh, maybe maybe it could take place immediately after the first scream and, and they'll work it in that way. But I, I would like the idea of you know, this this particular Scream movie and the way that these kids process what happened to the original trio back in the day, mm. like they're going full speed ahead in another direction and they're running the risk of forgetting what made all of this possible today. Like the, the foundation that they're standing on, like they're not respecting it and that'll come back around to get them. I think that is very interesting and very much likely to play a part in it. I do, when you latched onto that idea of retconning, um, I think that's also a really interesting thing. Cause I think, I mean, one, you could have a narrative that revolves around like retconning. Like, is there a killer who is literally trying to erase sections of history? And then how, as you said, how does that impact the three, the, the new characters moving forward? I also think in very scream stab, style, we could see a lot of referencing of the failed fourth reboot, like ha the failed Scream 4 reboot from a, and I, not artistically failed, Terry. No, I know. Uh, let's say, let's say <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I couldn't help, but like, yeah, have my I saw your face. My I heart, like, but I, say, I know what you meant. <laughs> you know, the kind of, I think we're going to see commentary about the fact that they attempted a stab TV series. I think we're going to see commentary about the fact that perhaps Jill did not get the fame and celebrity uh, that 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 she was hoping for. Uh, I feel like maybe there's going to be an element of, we need to actually properly reboot this horror because the last time didn't quite capture the world's imagination in the way that we expected it to, i.e. the killers and, and horror fans are gonna be thinking this. How do we make this new reboot 
actually connect uh, in a devastating new way. So I think that's an interesting approach that we could see as well. I like what you just mentioned, because some some other theories that I've been seeing out there is, you know, that some of the, the cast members from the Scream TV series will somehow get involved. And my mind immediately went to, and, and you know, to further emphasize, I didn't dislike that series. I really enjoyed watching it. Mm. But I don't want to see that have anything to do with this movie, except for the fact that when you bring up the fact that between now and when Scream 4 came out, a series did come out and it didn't exactly pan out super well. So the the idea of them looping that in and commenting on it, that seems like it could be a promising idea and a reasonable way to work the Scream TV series into this. 100%. And yeah, I think it's really interesting because the Scream, re the Scream TV series was also rebooted, right? Um, in its, oh, yeah, in its, it in a, in a, in a I never watched way. the um, rebooted episodes. I only I watched saw an episode. one and two. Maybe, maybe don't. Um, okay. But you know, that's, that's, that's what that's I heard, which of, is why I didn't wind up watching it. I think it had Tiger and like uh, uh, Kiki Palmer, um, so you could see like a, even just a nodding reference if Kiki Palmer shows up in the opening scene. It's like, okay, I see what's going on here. But yeah. yes, I, I think I think it's going to be retcon reboot uh, slasher extravaganza, and I'm, I'm quite I'm kind of pumped for it. Okay, it's my my turn again now, right? Mm -hmm. I'm on my third. So for my third, I I listed. Martha Meeks. I just really want Randy's presence to be felt in this movie. I guess that's more of the thing that I'm asking for. Randy's presence to be in Scream 2022. The only, all right, I'm going to kind of cheat here and throw us off because I, I have to bring up this one. I do not want to see this in this movie because it's connected. <laughs> You're jumping and ahead. When, when I saw it, it just... I don't want to get too extreme with this comment, but it kind of enraged me. It made me so angry that anyone out there could want this. And it's that Randy isn't really dead at all. He faked his death and he's actually still like, I don't want that. Randy is dead. Randy's one dead. of the big, one of the big things now I'm adding crap to my list. One of the big things that I want this movie to do is not mess with any of the previous movies that I do love in a way that changes how I watch those movies. And Randy being mm -hmm. alive would completely change the game and would completely ruin a really good sequence in Scream 2. I do not want which, that. Which, the power of which is all about the fact that they killed him and he's actually dead. And the shock of it is like, yes. oh my God, how could they do that? Don't rob it of that exactly. power. So I'm totally, I'm totally with you on that. But you do want Martha, you want Meekage, yes. right? You want so some Meekage like vibes. The only the only way to really bring that in is through Martha Meeks. And and again, we were talking about this last time. We know that some of the, the newer characters have Meeks in their last name. So I think According to that unofficial conference. Unofficial, unofficial. <laughs> but I think that having that family element is the way to work Randy into mm -hmm. this without saying he's not really dead at all. 100%. And I'm, I'm all on team uh, Kirby slash Meeks. I want, I want those, are the, those are the past elements that I want. Yes. Um, well, I might actually, because this kind of flows nicely, is this is my fifth one. Well, it's actually my fourth, but I'm going to number five and I'll do my fourth later, uh, is, is an odd one. I want cotton. <laughs> now, I don't want cotton alive because again we saw cotton die and i think from memory the shot was he's dead and he was talked about as if he's dead and he was reported on tmz or whatever it was as being dead but i like cotton weary and i loved leave schreiber and i loved that thread and i think that thread was pretty much ignored um in season in uh, episode in episode <laughs> in film four in screen yeah, four right there's not was. even a real reference to him which is fine he's dead and gone and that was you know he wasn't necessarily central um on screen all the time but i do like the fact uh i liked what he brought to it this falsely accused then the celebrity this sort of obsession with sydney i think you know when i was thinking about the cotton element i was like well given the way the scream motivations work a relative of cotton could very well be showing up and causing some damage here debbie salt style um but i just want i want cotton's presence to be acknowledged in some way whether someone's wearing a really great linen suit at some point i don't know just some sort of reference to cotton i can very much get behind that one as well i loved cotton's arc in these mm. movies i just didn't love the fact that they cut it short in Scream 3. I think they yeah. did that character a major disservice by not 
continuing to add to the layers that they gave him in Scream 2 because his turn in Scream 2 was far more interesting than anything I ever could have predicted. I, I was yeah. I was very, very surprised by how strong that character wound up being. And I thought that they had great opportunity to make even more of his role in this franchise. Mm -hmm. And he gets killed in the opening act of three. And, you know, as much as I love, love that movie and enjoy watching it, I think that that was a major missed opportunity in it. So I feel like he does deserve some acknowledgement after all that. Yeah, and I think had he stayed alive for that film, he was actually positioned really well narratively in terms of what he was doing to be a part of that story. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, I want some cotton. I want 100% cotton back on our <laughs> screens too. in some way. You know what else I what want is in this yours? movie? Yes. My next, my next one is I just want Red Right Hand to be in it. Please. <laughs> Please. It's in... It's in Scream. It's in Scream 2. It's in Scream 3. And then I think it wasn't... In, it wasn't in Scream 4 because of, you know, like copyright type issues okay. and, and getting the rights to the song. But I connect that song to this franchise and he, especially hearing it again, going to that uh, marathon and watching the movies in order straight through when you hear it three times and mm -hmm. it just ups your energy when it kicks in, it really just heavily emphasized the value of having that song in these movies. So I want it again. I want it too. I did see someone, a friend of mine tweet the other day that that is the song that they least want to be featured in any movie moving forward because it is so overused. Well, uh, but I feel like Scream set the template and they should they should yeah. keep their tweets for themselves. And I like the reference in Fear Street, um, which I believe used it as well at some point. Um, and my final one is very basic again. Uh, it's just, I want good ghost face dialogue. Uh, I don't know how you felt, but I felt by around three or four, the writers were getting a little, um, a little tired, a little forced. <laughs> it was like 7 p.m. in the writer's room uh, and the uh, sort of grotesque metaphors or suggestions or threats were getting a bit silly or maybe overly descriptive. Uh, and I can, I, I sort of compare like the, the cleanness, maybe I'm just, this is my English major editor background being like, brevity is the soul of wit and like, got you like a fish works a lot more as a brutal threat than I'm going to slit your eyelids open so that when I'm watching, when I'm killing you, you can watch me and can't close your eyeballs. Um, so I just feel like, <laughs> let's let's keep it quick, let's keep it clean, make it threatening, let's not get silly. And on that front, I'd also like to see some more quiz action. So I love, I love the actual interaction. If they're gonna be, I don't know, if they're gonna be doing it with okay. like a customer service bot on Facebook version of Ghostface or they're on the phone, I want, I want horror, trivia and I want it done well. And I felt like the Scream 4 element of horror trivia kind of got cut short with Kirby mm -hmm. because she just started listing off every film under the sun and they didn't get to ask any more questions. Yeah. She didn't play that game right. But um, yeah, I want, <laughs> I want brutality and I want uh, jeopardy. Let's say that. Yeah. I feel like this goes hand in hand with uh, the meta nature of the films and who the killer winds up being because you know, even though I think that the ghost face dialogue in one and two in particular is stronger than three and four, mm. I feel like it couldn't have been any other way in three and four because it suited who who wound up being the killers in those movies. Like it, it felt uh, like that came yeah. from them versus coming from, let's say, Billy and Stu in the first one. So, you know, I, I definitely have to give them a pass with that in mind, but you know, if I'm thinking about Ghostface quotable lines or ones that really gave me chills, those lie more in the first two films than they do in the second two. So I hear you on this. Yeah, hundred um, percent. But I do take your point. I don't. I don't think um, uh, <laughs> uh, Roman was going to ever be the best Ghostface no. scribe. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was not. All right, I'm wrapping up my list with a big one, mm -hmm. like a big broad yes. one. And it's, it's basically sequel potential because we know now what happened with Scream 4. When that movie was, was gearing up for its release, we kind of all thought that it was going to be a passing of the torch situation, that they weren't going to want to close the door on the Scream franchise, that they were going to want to keep it going, but you can't keep it going with the same characters. So you got to bring in a new young crop of characters and then let them take the series forward. That didn't happen. And I think that was a good choice for four because I liked the surprise of all of that. But you can't play right, that yeah. game again with five. And, you know, 
I am sensitive to the idea, and you know, we've seen it happen time and time again. You take an iconic horror franchise and you just make movies until they completely run out of steam. I don't want to see that happen with this series because in my book, at least, this series has four very strong films. And 100%. I have a good feeling they're going to get a strong fifth one. But, man, it's not easy to keep those creative juices flowing to keep a franchise alive. But I want them to keep it alive. So I want this movie to tee up this new batch of characters in a way that gives it loads of potential moving forward. Yeah, I think what you say is absolutely right, that a lot of these franchises get ran into the ground and cheapened. And um, then you have like the creative, the, the the big creatives come in and do a big reboot. I'm talking, you know, Halloween, right? Uh, or Friday the 13th might get another reboot eventually with some big director coming through or, you know, Candyman's got Nia DaCosta and et cetera. Uh, and there's a new creative vision. But the screen movies stand apart from that, I think, because they've always had a ton of care and quality mm -hmm. Uh, a ton of care going into them and quality on all sides of the camera, right? Um, and I think that's what sort of distinguished them. Uh, and the other thing that's distinguished them, and I think this is comes down to sequel potential as well, is that it's a franchise, as we've said, or many, what everyone has said, is 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 so much more about the survivors than it is about its villain. Um, you know, whereas so many franchises are defined by their central killer, uh, whether it's Friday the Thirteenth or um, Halloween to an extent, although I think Laurie Strode is is a defining hero of that. But and then Freddy Krueger, obviously, I think is is perhaps the definitional example of that. Uh, this is really Sydney Prescott, uh, Dewey, and Gale's thing, and we ride or die with this franchise, uh, not because of whoever you know Roman. Uh, we die with it. We go with it because of this trio. And so, what I'm really hoping that this film delivers, uh, that I don't think the film, the the screen four delivered, whether or not they had been killed or not, uh, or gone in that direction, is a really compelling core group of survivors that mm -hmm. we could follow moving forward. Um, so I want to, you know, it doesn't need to be three. It doesn't need to be interchangeable with Gail, Dewey, and Sydney, but a core group that I genuinely want to move forward with, and I'm genuinely excited to see get through a mystery, um, the next mystery, and the next set of amazing set pieces. All right, so now that we've said all the things we want to see, do we want to touch on a few that we do not want to see? Absolutely. I think um, we both already named one on our list, so do you want to take your other one? Yeah, sure. My, my first one was Ghostface on TikTok, don't want yeah. it, even though Perry wants it, but she wants it well done. Uh, and I will go with, uh, I don't want anyone related to Sydney to be behind the mask. Um, I feel like we've had that twice now in the last two films, um, the distanced relations and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But I just feel like we need the killer to also start that next part of the yes. story, if that makes sense. So I think, you know, we want our core, core trio, but this, this cannot be about Sydney's dark past because frankly, she's obviously done 23 and me. She's obviously looked into her background till Till to find everything right, like surely she's she's gone on that that PBS show, and just made sure that there's no more skeletons because I just want to live my life with my dog and the whatever with Patrick Dempsey wherever he went. Um, but you know, I'm kind of like I need the killer to be related to a new storyline, um, and our central. I would like it to have nothing to do with the central three or have some connective tissue to the central three, but still be much more about the people or the person that we're going to be moving forward with. I'm not creative enough to figure out exactly what I'm getting at here, but I'm not opposed to the killer being somewhat related to a different member of the central three. Mm. I don't know. I'm fine with that as long as it also ties to someone who's moving forward. Yes, yes. I, because I'm it with, can't be very much with you on that. It can't be that the central character has nothing to do with the killer in the first one, and then we just suddenly, for some reason, follow her into the next yeah, yeah. movie. Yeah, it makes sense. I think they can come up with a with a good balance there. So mm -hmm. most of my items on this list are related to the central three. I mean, I already I already mentioned the one that you know Randy isn't really dead. I do not want to see that. The other someone isn't really dead that I have seen floating around this out there is crazy. that I cannot tolerate. <laughs> is Stu not being dead. And it's not just, you know, fan theories. It's also something that Matthew Lillard himself has kind of fueled because he said, I believe that, you know, you don't really know that he's dead. Like, it's just a TV. He could be, no, he can't. His, his head was fried. Stu is dead. 
Well, but the interesting thing is that he didn't just say he might not be dead. He said the original Scream 3 script. Well, yeah. Is that true? I'm like, was about so, Stu and Stu was, and it was set in Woodsboro and then they canceled because of, you know, things that were happening in the world and went in a different direction. Maybe I, I mean, as, as such a big fan, maybe I should have been aware of that. That was the first time that I had seen that mm. as, as a possibility. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that was considered at one point, because I imagine literally everything was considered over the course of this franchise, but I mean, that idea would not have worked very well for me. And thinking about it now that Stu could return, like it still doesn't work well for me. I don't want to see it. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. Stu, no, 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 no. Dead. Not okay. Kirby dead. Dead, dead, dead. Yes. So then this next one here is, is, is another one that gets me like really riled up. I see theories out there that, you know, Sydney, if not the main trio, are going to die as like an I gotcha moment in the opening scene of the film. Do not see, do I, that. I, I'm like, do not do that because it's going to like, how do we recover from that for the rest of the movie? Um, I think that is uh, something I would be... I don't want that to happen. I'm less, I would be less upset at, the, I don't know, I don't know. I, don't, I honestly don't know if I could continue watching the movie. So I will say that, like if, if, if particularly if it was Sydney, if it was Gail, I, I love Gail, but I'm like, I could, I could potentially move on with the movie and if they did it well, but I'm like, I don't know. Man, I don't and I don't know. know whether it's worse, which is my final one, which, well, it's your final one, but I'm gonna take it, which is, <laughs> Sydney or one of them being the killer, right? Yeah. And I don't know which is so, worse. I think that's more unlikely. I think that's less likely that they would make one of them the killer. All right. To to backtrack, I'm yeah. I'm with you. I don't think I could recover if one of the three died in the opening act and then I had to shift my focus to new characters and, and getting yeah. that that fresh start. I I don't think I could do it. When it comes to the killer, though, you'll see in the notes, I only listed two names there. <laughs> So I don't want to see Sydney or Dewey wind up behind the mask. There, there is something very interesting to me about the idea of, and I'm not fully behind this. I'm half-heartedly mentioning this theory, but there is something interesting about the idea of Gail losing steam in her career, something that was addressed in Scream 4, and her manufacturing another situation. And you know what? Maybe she does it by accident. Maybe she just yeah. starts to spark something so that she has material to work with and it gets out of hand. But there's there's something there that I think I would be open to exploring. I'm open to that. And I think it's less like, no, you didn't, than uh, others. And it also, you know, she, she's got a connection to the Woodsboro High Film Club. Maybe 10 years later, she goes and that's how we connect to our new generation. She's like, hey, boys, want to want to go and fake a death and then it maybe they get carried away. And I, I see what you're saying. It's sort of, but I, my one thing about that is that if you were to ask most Scream fans, what is the most obvious way that one of the central three could be the killer or well, what's the yeah. most obvious plot twist of course. that you could have in Scream 5? I think it's that Gail waning career somehow is the killer, puts the killer in action. So I think I would be okay with that from a narrative point of view because it makes sense and it's it's a stretch, but if she's if it gets out of control, it's not like an overly stretch, but it's not massively surprising is what I would no. say. Which is probably why I'm open to it. It's because yeah. I could see the story potential in something, whereas- It makes sense. Like my my creative brain isn't strong enough to see the story potential in the other two. But for all I know, the filmmakers will come up with something super smart and they'll manage to pull it off with them. It's just the way that my brain is working right now, I don't want it. <laughs> Are you, okay, Sydney, one of them dying in the opening sequence. Okay, what if they die later in the film? What well, do we, different. if there's a Randy moment, I can deal with that, I think. I can I can deal with that, especially if it's, you know, in the context of the film, they earn it. Yeah. Like I think I'm mentally prepared for that because, you know, these are three people who have survived seemingly impossible situations for four films now. I mean, that luck's got to run out a, like eventually. So I think for the sake of a realistic scenario, I would be I'd be open to it. Do you want it? Are we adding an 11th no, to our wants? I don't think it's a want. 
Because I could, mm. do, like, I'm not convinced that it's necessary. Yeah. If I, if I thought it was necessary, I would put it on a want list. Yeah, I think what I what I also don't want is for uh, Dewey to be almost dead again. I think you can't you can't play that game no. again. No, that's because that's, that's been done quite a few times. Yes. Let's stop that now. I'm like, if he gets in that situation, I'm like, probably better with him not waking up. Yeah. Don't kill me, fans. But I'm just, you know. Hey, I love that character so much, but I'm I'm with you on that. They've they've played <laughs> that game too many times now. Hundred percent. And that's all the things I don't want. I love how every single time we do one of these episodes, we're like short and concise, and it just gets longer and longer every time. But I feel like it's it's just reflective of the fact that we love this series and we genuinely love talking about it. Like I I can't get enough of this, and I feel like the new Bev screening just not that my love for this franchise wasn't already through the roof, but man, did that light a scream fire in me. Well, I feel like you keep mentioning this new Bev uh, screening to for some sort of drinking game for the hyper fans, but also just to make okay. me feel terrible about the fact oh, no. that I wasn't able to be there. My heart is broken, but I'm so happy you got that experience. And I saw your photos uh, dressed up, so pumped after each film. I was like, I'm there in spirit. I am a big believer that there's going to be many of those yes. in a whole bunch of theaters before the fifth one comes out. And if I'm on the East Coast, I I mean this wholeheartedly. I will do that again in a heartbeat and we should go. Like something we like should. going to the Nighthawk or the Alamo or something. Oh, it'd be so good. Well, they yeah. are definitely releasing number one October yeah. 10, I believe, with this with special one in, look at Scream Was it one and two? I don't know, but my birthday is October 8th. Send all your presents, um, but uh, it's so it's happening at a very good time. Um, so I'm very excited for that. So at the very least, we'll get the two best ones. Yes, according to my list. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still love them though. Like I'm, I'm, I'm totally cool with you saying that because <laughs> two and four are just so close, so close for me. So close. All right, before we say goodbye to everyone, is there anything you want to promote? Let anyone know that you're working on. No, just generally go and see us at Rotten Tomatoes. Um, I'm, I work there. <laughs> we have great stuff. Uh, I think you'll find, Scream fans may note, that uh, Scream 4 has had an interesting journey, Perry. Um, it is officially fresh. I don't know when it turns, but you know, as reviews get added, these movies change their tomato meters. And for the longest time since it's released, Scream 4 was in the high 50 percentile. Uh, but now it's a solid 60% and it's been 60% for a long time. So the only Rotten film is Scream 3. Uh, but go to Rotten Tomatoes. We will be covering Scream like crazy, uh, as well as all the other great slasher films which are coming out in the next little while, including Halloween. I believe Candyman's probably out by the time you're watching this. Um, but yeah, exciting times for, for scary fans. Fans of scary I things. I will go with a ladies night plug, but one that's scream related because I just had Olivia Scott Welch from Fear Street on the show and turns out she auditioned for Scream 2022 and I was an asshole and I asked about it, but she was lovely about it. And she also gave me her own scream ranking. So if you want to check that out, it is on the Collider YouTube channel, but that is it. And guess what? I still have no outro saying, what did I do last time? Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Cindy. I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I got nothing. We're out of here. Right, we're tired. She's just been a marathon <laughs> at the New Beverly. I know she mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>